Well, let me go to the word of the Lord. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I want to share from the book of Exodus. We're going to the book of Exodus. And I'd like to read this from the story that you may know if you have been to Sunday school, the story of the golden calf. Moses went to Mount Sinai. God gave him the Ten Commandments. The first one was not to have any other God. The second one was not to make any idols and worship them instead of the true God. So he comes down from the mountain. He's been gone so long, praying and fasting and seeking God. The people are getting nervous. They don't have a leader present among them. And, and so they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, who's the high priest, and they said, you need to do something about this. We don't know what's happened to Moses. He may never come back. He might have died on the mountain. We'll never know that. We might sit here a year before we have to give up, move on. So in the meantime, we need to worship. So make us a God. And he said, okay, bring all of your, your jewelry that you took from Egypt. The Egyptians had to pay you off to get you out of there. I want you to take the jewelry. And, uh, and by the way, God intended it for it to be used in the tabernacle. Uh, but, and he said, give them to me, I'll take care of it. And so we read in Exodus 32, and I'm reading the New King James, Exodus 32, 4 and 5. Exodus 32 and 4, and he, Aaron, received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And of course, the Lord here, you'll notice is in capitals, that signifies the name of God that was revealed to Israel, Jehovah or Yahweh. And he said, we're going to use this golden calf to worship God, to worship Yahweh. Now, I think this is very interesting and uh, enlightening, and I want to bring out the significance. But before I actually deal with this text, let's think about where we are in relationship to the, the Christmas season. You know, every year, there's always somebody that wants to know, well, why do we celebrate Christmas? And the easy answer is, well, you know, we honor the birth of Jesus Christ. It's the most significant event in human history. Um, in fact, even our calendar reflects that B.C., before Christ, and A.D., year of our Lord, uh, of the Latin version. And so all of history has changed because God entered the human race. And, of course, we know he didn't just come to live, but he came to die and pay the price for our sins. And so we rightly recognize this is a watershed in human history, that God would be manifest in the flesh. But some people say, well, who knows if he was born on December 25th and Probably he wasn't. And I said, well, you know, that goes back to the ancient pagan festivals, the winter solstice, the Saturnalia, and all these wild pagan celebrations. And, and uh, maybe even some of our customs come, some from Rome, some from Germanic tribes, some from the Middle Ages, some from Martin Luther. You know, the candles, the Christmas tree, the ornaments. It's just a mishmash of things over the centuries. It's not from the Bible, and I would say that's true. Nobody makes you celebrate Christmas. If it's in the Bible that you should, then if you should. Uh, since it's not in the Bible, if you want to celebrate it, you can. If you want to go to work on Christmas, you can. If you want to eat dinner with your family, you can. If you want to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you can. The church doesn't really have a position on that. Um, if you want to come to the church and sit in the parking lot and pray, you can. If you want to stay at home and party, you can. We really don't care. If the Bible said you needed to celebrate it, we would preach it. But since the Bible doesn't say, uh, we don't preach it. But does that mean it's forbidden? And some say, well, you know, we shouldn't involve ourselves in pagan things. Well, I do think you have to distinguish. If something involves the pagan worship, we've got to stay away from it. But if something involves our culture, then we... We judge what is culturally appropriate and what is not. And we, it's okay to follow our culture as long as we maintain the Word of God. For example, I think most of you probably call this day Sunday. I don't know if you realize it's in honor of the sun god. Just as Monday is in honor of the moon god. And uh, you go on down through the days of the week. Uh, Thursday is in honor of the, the Norse god, the Germanic god Thor. 
So if you feel that you are worshiping these gods and paying them homage and that your friends will all conclude that you are uh, promoting pagan worship, then I suggest you call them first day, second day, third day, fourth day, whatever you wish. We're getting ready to enter January, named in honor of the, Greek, the, the Roman god Janus. So again, if that offends you, maybe you should say first month instead of January. My point is, all of us have learned that even though something may have originally had a pagan connotation, if we have appropriated it in a proper way so that we are not involving ourselves in pagan worship and our friends and family as onlookers do not believe that we are, then there's no harm done. So I think each of us needs to decide what's appropriate as far as Christmas celebration. Actually, some say, well, it's the winter solstice. Here's what I think happened. All those pagans in the 2nd century, 3rd century Rome, as Christianity exploded in the Roman Empire, these Christians were trying to live for God. Well, on the solstice and on the Saturnalia, people went crazy. They threw aside morality. Uh, they had orgies. They had wild riots and parties, and, and uh, this was the custom. And so that new Christian would sometimes find himself sucked back into that pagan lifestyle on that particular day. All of his friends were going out and getting drunk. They were going out to their pagan feast. And so the church said, look, don't go with your friends. He says, well, I won't get drunk. I won't participate in the orgy. I'll just watch. They said, no, don't go with your friends. Come with us. And so I really believe what happened is the church said, you know what? We're not going to allow our converts to get sucked into a worldly lifestyle. We're going to celebrate Jesus Christ. We're going to come to church. We're going to worship God. And we're going to reinforce the true meaning of ourselves as people of God. Well, that's a good thing. Anytime the church can take something in the world, tries to destroy, and turn around and use it to promote the kingdom of God, it's a good thing. I think that's what really happened. Now what's happening is the world's trying to do the opposite. And taking what, uh, what the church has designed to focus on the Lord and trying to turn it back into the world again. And so that's the tug of war that we're in. So however you choose to celebrate or not, that's up to you. Romans chapter 14 is very specific. If you want to set aside a certain day into the Lord, go ahead. If you want to treat every day the same, go ahead. As long as it's unto the Lord. So whatever you do this week... Whatever you do Christmas Day, just make sure it's under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That whatever you do is unto the Lord. Now, I took some time there, but it fits into what I want to say today. Because what we see here in the Exodus account is the people were struggling with this idea of worshiping the one true God whom they could not see. For some reason, it's so hard for people to walk by faith. They would rather walk by sight. That's true of us, isn't it? And so there's an intense pressure of the culture around us to worship God according to the way the world says. To manufacture God in our image. It's the pressure of the tangible, the visible. It's the pressure of trying to have a God that you can see and that therefore you can control. After all, if your God is represented by an idol, it's easy to hide him when you want to do something that he doesn't want you to do. It's easy to bring him out for a ceremonial occasion. And it's easy to put him back for the rest of the week. It's easy to exert control over what he looks like and what he does. Because you are the one who created him. And you might ask, why did they make a golden calf? It seems that the reason is that in Egypt, the worship of the bull was one of the most prominent forms of worship. And so they were reverting back to their cultural roots and the pressure of the world around them. Even though it was never Israel's God, it was the God of the world around them. 
So when they got stuck in the wilderness, they couldn't see God. They couldn't feel God. They couldn't hear God. They didn't have the man of God right there to speak to them. They reverted to what was comfortable and familiar and tangible. They pulled from their cultural upbringing to say, well, we'll worship the bull. Others say, as they went into the land of Canaan, of course, they would be focused on the need for fertility, the crops to grow and the herds to proliferate and the families to be blessed. And so there are a lot of fertility rights involving animals and involving bulls there too. So not only was it the culture of where they were coming from, it was the culture of where they were going to. In other words, the pressure of the world around them caused them to choose a God that resembled the world instead of the true God. You know, it's interesting when later in Israelite history, Israel became a nation, the kingdom was divided, Jeroboam rebelled against uh, the the line of David, and uh, he split off ten tribes. And they couldn't go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of worship. It was where the temple was. All Jewish males were supposed to come worship in Jerusalem on behalf of their families. Jeroboam realized if the people of my kingdom all flock to Jerusalem, the the capital of the other kingdom, every year, then I'll lose their loyalty. So what did he do? He set up a golden calf, one in the north and one in the south. So the people would always have a convenient place to worship and wouldn't have to go into Jerusalem. And every king after him to the end of that northern kingdom continued this practice. So there's something very powerful about the pressure of the world. that The world around us pressures us to worship according to the custom of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul alludes to this. He says, don't be conformed to the world around you. Don't let the world pressure you and mold you. Make sure when you worship God, you're not worshiping according to what the world says God is, but according to what God says God is. And then notice something more insidious. Not only do we see in this story people conforming to worldly worship or people borrowing from pagan ideas to worship God, but notice carefully in the story Aaron and the people said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. This is Yahweh. When we worship this golden calf, we're actually worshiping Yahweh. So not only did they go astray into pagan worship, but they twisted the worship of God to say, we're actually worshiping the true God in a new way. Notice how dangerous that is. It's one thing to commit a sin. You've done wrong, you know you've done wrong. And uh, when you're ready, as long as God is merciful and the unexpected doesn't happen, if you decide that you need to repent, you repent and you come back to God. If you backslide, you understand that you are in a backslidden condition. You're not currently serving God, but you still know where God is. You still know who God is. You still know where to go to find God. You still know how to obtain mercy. You still know what is right and wrong. But when you say this new form of worship is really worshiping God, then you become deceived. Then there's really, unless some outside influence wakes you up, or unless God is merciful and speaks to you and and somehow there remains some sensitivity to hear His voice, you've got a main problem. Because you no longer know that what you're doing is wrong. You no longer realize that your worship is false. Because you think you're worshiping God. But you have molded God into your own image. So now you're really worshiping your own ideas. You're really worshiping yourself. But you don't think about repenting because you don't think you're doing anything wrong. So when they started worshiping the golden calf, No doubt there were some who said, wait a minute, we don't worship idols. But then somebody else said, oh, but this is the new way to worship Jehovah. 
oh, we're not worshiping the bull from Egypt. We're not worshiping the bulls of Canaan. We're worshiping Jehovah. This is our God. It's okay. When somebody would say, wait a minute, isn't that Egyptian? We're not Egyptians. We're Israelites. We're the people of God. Oh, well, this is the new way to worship God. You don't have to worship the Egyptian God. Worship this God. He's the real God. It's okay. That is really dangerous, isn't it? When you worship God in your own image. It's worse than simply sinning or backsliding. But it's becoming deceived. Representing the true God by falsehood. And that's why the Bible is so strict against idols. Because when you make an idol, when you make an image and you worship that as God, you're actually substituting your idea of who God is for the real God. For example, we worship Jesus Christ. If someone has a picture of Jesus, they've got a picture of him has some kind of race. He's going to look white or black or brown or something. And whatever picture you make him as, you now are focusing on that as God and not the fact that God transcends all race. Jesus Christ, yes, he was historically born as a Jew, but you see what I'm saying? When you try to reduce him to one image, then you're saying, well, he's more for my race than another race, when truly he needs to be for every race. So if we, and I'm not against painting or sculpture, but the point should be very emphasized very clearly, we cannot involve any of those things in worship. In, in worshiping a statue or an idol or paying reverence to a picture. Why? Because anything we try to use to substitute for true spiritual heartfelt worship and reverence that belongs to God only, that will limit God. That will distort God. That will reduce God to our thinking, to our prejudices, to our biases. We've got to let God stand above us. We've got to let God be God. We've got to get, let God explode our prejudices our traditions, our biases, our customs. We must be servants of the true God. But instead, there's a danger of remaking God in the image of our culture. Remaking God in our image. And so I do agree, there's a danger associated with Christmas celebration if all the trappings become Christmas, if they become worship if they become our idea of God. As long as it's just a tool to help people who are formerly pagan to come and celebrate Jesus Christ. As long as it's a tool to remind us of who Jesus really is and what he's done, then Christmas can be great. But when we get sucked into a materialistic, worldly, pagan culture under the guise of Christmas, then we have remade God in our image. Romans 1, 25 says what happens when people became idolaters, they turned the truth into a lie. That's what Israel did. They said, we worship Jehovah. That's true. But then they said, when you worship this calf, you are worshiping Jehovah. That's a lie. There are a lot of churches that say, we worship God. That's true. We worship Jesus. That's true. But when they try to make him in their image, they turn the truth into a lie. And then the Bible says, Romans 1.25, what that means is they worship the creature more than the creator. Because when we worship a God of our manufacture, who are we really worshiping? Ourselves. It's not what God has revealed himself to be. It's what we want him to be. So now we're worshiping our own thinking. Which is why Paul goes on in Romans to say, when they started doing that, they got into immorality. Because you start worshiping the creature... Then ultimately you say, I'm not getting enough thrills out of bowing down this golden calf. Where can I get my thrills? And so you look at your body. You look at sexual immorality. And then people that go into that lifestyle and a culture that goes in that lifestyle, after a while they say, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. This is what, what my school friends told me it was. This is not what the media says it is. This is not what the pornography industry says it is. I'm not getting the same thrills. So then they say, well, let's try homosexuality. That, that ought to be something different 
And I'm, this is found in Romans 1. So the culture keeps looking for more and more and more. What's the real problem? They're trying to find satisfaction in the creature. And they'll never find it. Whether they go into drugs or alcohol or sexual promiscuity, homosexuality, transgender, transsexuality. That's the next thing. They'll never find it anywhere else until they make God God. Until they start worshiping the creator instead of the created. Praise God. So that's what's wrong with our culture. I don't despise the people that go into these sins. I'm just saying the reason for them is because they're seeking truth in the wrong place. They've turned truth into a lie. And they can never get to truth as long as they follow the lie. As long as they try to find satisfaction in worshiping the creature, the created world. They'll never be able to worship the Creator. So, let's make some applications here. You can make your own. But I just thought of several that are common today. Of people worshiping God, but changing Him into their image. Making a golden calf. Not too many of us have actually made golden calves and bowed down and worshiped them. Because that just doesn't appeal to us. We know that's not God. But... Some people, coming in an austere culture, they look at God as the disciplinarian, as the killjoy, the jailer, the policeman, sergeant God. And so their focus is on a God who's vindictive, a God who's going to punish you, a God if you do something wrong, he's going to zap you. People in church can transform the God of mercy and love into Sergeant God and worship a false God. I could preach on that a while. People who are self-righteous, people who are holier than thou, people who are judgmental. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a truth, there is a right, and there is a wrong. And I'll get on that in a minute. But we cannot reduce God to a disciplinarian. We cannot reduce God to someone standing up in heaven with a baseball bat. And as soon as you cross his path, he's going to whack you. That is not who God is. That might be your image of God, but that's not God. And if you're trying to please that kind of God, you'll never please that kind of God. So just living by rules and regulations will never cause you to please God. Because you've got a false concept of God. So in our... In our American history, even in our Christian and Pentecostal history, there's that danger of making God in our image. Especially as we see the culture degenerate, we can easily react to the opposite extreme and say, well, my God doesn't approve of that. Therefore, my God is this God of legalism or punishment. Now, the, the second thought, I'm, and I'm just giving, I'm quickly coming to a close, but I'm just giving you some thoughts. We live in a very materialistic culture now, which glorifies money, material things, possessions. And of course, unfortunately, Christmas sometimes get caught up, gets caught up in that keeping up with the Joneses mentality. And people seek satisfaction in material things. And so we also make God our image, and Christians sometimes do this, that God is basically a cosmic vending machine. I go to God, I push the button, he has to give me what I want. This idea of prosperity, I do believe God wants to bless us, but when we reduce God to a materialistic image, as God, I deserve to be rich, I deserve to be happy, I deserve this and that and the other. No, that's your cultural image. If you are a Christian in Ethiopia, or if you are a Christian in Iran, or a Christian in Egypt right now, you might be just thanking God that you're alive. You wouldn't think that you are deserved to drive a Mercedes or a Cadillac or live in a big house. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying making God, reducing God to the image of prosperity is not the God of the Bible, it's the God of your culture. So God becomes... Your heavenly butler. He becomes your servant. And prayers become your list, your daily list of what your butler is supposed to do today. Now, God, I think you need to do this. I need you, you need to carry out the trash. 
Um, I, 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 you need to go get me this. You need to go get me that. Servant God. You're my heavenly servant. And then we now live in a multicultural world where there are many different cultures. There's good and bad. We have great diversity in our church. It's good. We draw from the strengths and the talents, the uniqueness of various cultures, races, backgrounds, so on. That's good. But there's a problem because we seem to think that we just have to be tolerant of every idea. So every cultural opinion is just as good as every other. So if you're from a culture that believes in polygamy, it's okay to have several wives. If your culture says men can beat their wives, if the wives uh, talk back at them, then it's okay to beat your wife. So everything becomes culturally relative and acceptable. That's where we're headed here in America. This idea of multiculturalism taken to the extreme where God is... Like your indulgent uncle. You know, if, you're, if you've got a favorite uncle, he's going to buy you stuff. He's going to give you candy. But if you yell and scream, he doesn't want to spank you. He doesn't want to put you in time out. Uh, if you've got a problem, he doesn't want to take care of it. He doesn't want to change your diaper. He wants to give you back to your parents. So he's just there to make you feel good for a short time so you'll think he's your favorite uncle. But when you really need help, he doesn't want to be bothered. That's what some people want God to be. Uncle God, just bless me when I want it, but don't mess into my life. Leave me alone otherwise. Kind of like God is a heavenly customer service representative. The customer is always right. Yes, sir, what would you like today? Yes, I realize that you purchased this and you went and you trashed it and you broke it. Now you want to come back for a full refund. But you know that's okay. We want more customers, so we'll give you a full refund, no questions asked, because the customer is always right. That's the kind of God a lot of people want. Lord, I messed up my life. I know your Bible says I shouldn't be involved in fornication or adultery. But, you know, at the moment it felt good. It felt right. I know I messed up my marriage. I know my kids are messed up. I need counseling. But I want you to do a miracle. Fix all my kids. Fix me. Do it by noon today, and I'll praise you forever. Fortunately, God is merciful. He will help us. But we're trying to make God in our image. God, you've got to do all this stuff for me. You've got to fix me. I'm never wrong. If you don't help me, then you're going to be wrong. If you don't forgive me, you're wrong. If you would send me to hell, I don't want a God like that. Of course, the truth, God doesn't send anybody to hell, but their own choices send them there. But the idea of our culture is nobody goes to hell. In our culture, 95% or more of the people believe they're going, they're, there is a heaven, and they believe they're going to heaven. Very few people really believe there's a hell, and even those that believe that don't think they're going there. Now, when you're preaching a sermon as a pastor for a funeral, sure, you give the benefit of the doubt. You say that God is the judge. You don't try to put somebody in hell. You try to be as kind as the merciful and leave it up to God. But at the end of the day, there is a right, there is a wrong. There is a heaven to gain, there is a hell to shun. There is a judgment where every single human being will stand alone before God with no support system, with no argument. There will be no lawyer to plead your case, and there will be no case to plead because God knows the intents and desires of the heart, the end from the beginning. He can pull out the records. What I'm trying to say in closing, we need to recapture the understanding that God is God. God is awesome. God, not in the trivial colloquial sense, but the sense of he inspires awe. When you're standing before God, there is going to be just a little bit of trembling. There's just going to be a little sense of majesty. Yes, thank God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can know him and we can come into his presence. But still, when we come into his presence, there is a certain degree of reverence and respect and awe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's like the beautiful sun. It's beautiful. We see it every day. But if you don't respect it and you decide to stare in the face of the sun for more than a few seconds, you'll go blind. 
Even though it's there to help you and guide you. Even though it's there every day and you can easily forget it or assume it, take advantage of it. When the time comes that you disrespect it, you're the one who suffers. Because you can't play with sun. You can't make the sun something is not. It's going to shine. And if you boldly try to stare back, you will not out you will not win the staring match. You will lose. That's who God is. He's loving, he's kind, he's available every day. He shines down upon us, but don't take him for granted. He's still awesome. He's holy. That means he's separate from sin. God is transcendent. He's high, lofty, above. He's unique. There is no one like him. You cannot truly compare him adequately to anything or anyone else. He's in a class by himself. He, de- he defies all philosophical examination. He defies all sophisticated analysis. The chemist cannot discern the quality of God. The physicist cannot define the quality of God. The mathematician cannot write a formula to describe God. God is unique. God is alone. God is in a class by himself. God is holy. God is magnificent. God is awesome. God is just. God is truth. But here's the beautiful part, and this is why I do celebrate Christmas. Having said everything I said, here's why Christmas is meaningful to me. Because what no other religion of the world tells you, what no other philosophy of the world tells you is this. That same God that I pre- just preached about. If you try to stare in his face, you'll go blind, not him. That same God is love. First John 4, 8. Not just that he has love. Not that he's loving most of the time. Not that he acts in a loving way. Not that if you get on his good side, he'll love you. Not if, you, if you're nice to him, he'll be nice to you. But God is love. That's his essence. That's who he is. Now, that's mean that, that his love will prevent a sinner from receiving the ultimate consequences of their own choice. Because he loves us so much, he respects our choice. But what it does mean, God is not just capable of loving. No matter what the circumstance, God is love. When you are serving him, he loves you. When you're in direct rebellion against his will, he still loves you. When you're spitting in his face and blaspheming him, he still loves you at that moment. Your biggest danger, help, I want to understand, you to understand this. Your biggest danger is not simply that you would blaspheme God, but your biggest danger is that you would turn God into a creature of your own making because then there's no way out. You can shake your fist against God, but if you still are shaking your fist against the holy God, there's a point where you can humble yourself before that same God. Hakaramahasi. That's why even atheists can be saved. Because after all, they're preaching against a God they don't even believe in. They have to think about Him to say they don't believe in Him. There is a concept of God in the mind of the atheist. He's against the God that's true and just as holy. He's still believing in a God that he doesn't believe in. But what's worse than being an atheist is changing God and saying, I worship God, but it's my uncle God. It's my customer service representative God. It's my sergeant God. Because then you, you don't even understand who God is. The atheist understands who God is and doesn't want him. You don't even know who he is. You think you know him, but you're serving a God that you created. You're serving a golden calf, and you think that's God. How can you be saved when you're worshiping a golden calf? If you say, I don't want to worship God, God can strike you from heaven with a light and say, Do you, you want to, would you like to reconsider? And you can say on second thought, yes. But if you're worshiping a golden calf and saying, that's my God... What will ever change you? The golden calf will never speak and say, hey, I'm not really God. And every time you pray to God, you're praying to that golden calf. So the true God says, you know what? I can't answer those kind of prayers. Where's your hope? Unless some preacher or some saint of God says, you better not worship a God of your making. You better not worship a God of your culture. You can't afford to change the truth into a lie. You can't afford to worship the creature more than creator. But you've got to worship the true God. 
the infinite, awesome, almighty, holy, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who loves us so much that he came in the form of a baby. He lay in a manger. He nursed at his mother's breast. He grew. He died on the cross. He rose again. That's the God you need to serve. Forget about your golden calves. Forget about your golden calves. It's time to kneel at the feet of Jesus, the God who reveals himself, the God who gives, the God who loves. It's very biblical to give at Christmas. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let's stand together. The presence of God is here. If you have any spiritual discernment at all, you can feel something awesome. It's not like when you eat a piece of candy. It's not like when you listen to pop music. It's not that kind of good feeling. It's the kind of good feeling when you, when you see the Rocky Mountains rise up, when you see the sunrise or the sunset, when you hear a majestic symphony, when you hear a mighty chorus. It's that kind of feeling. Awesome. His presence is here right now. And the purpose of his presence is simply this. Leave the golden calf in the dust of the wilderness and come into my presence. Receive my spirit. I'm here to love. I'm here to give. I'm here to save. Would you come right now if you need grace and mercy? If you need repentance, if you need forgiveness, if you need the power of the Holy Spirit, would you come to the front right now, kneel in the presence of God, or stand here and worship Him? Would you come? If you have a special need in your life,